Welcome back to History Class with Dr. W. In this next series of lectures, we're going to be discussing the process of westward expansion, where American settlers began to flood across the American West, and ultimately, what kinds of things are they going to find there, and what kinds of issues are those encounters going to cause. Ultimately, it is westward expansion, the process of taking over territory like Texas, the Mexican War, the acquisition of other territory in the West, and ultimately the question of slavery and what is going to happen to slavery in those newly acquired Western territories that is going to lead us ultimately toward the Civil War. When we think about the process of westward expansion, it's important to consider the motivations for individuals moving across the West. We're going to be thinking collectively about thousands and even tens of thousands of these prospectors and settlers who make their way across the West. But we also need to consider that each individual who made that journey had their own reasons. And there were dozens and dozens, probably more, of reasons that motivated individuals or families to undertake this arduous process of moving across the West. So broadly speaking, we might think about various kinds of opportunity, um, all kinds of opportunity that might lay to the west of those original settlements along the east and even along the Mississippi. We might be thinking in terms of cotton land that was available in places like Texas, or we might think about the quest for furs and beaver pelts in Oregon, or those who might be seeking out some of the fine port cities along the coast of California, which one writer described as one of the finest, if not the very best, harbor in the world. And a sea captain who described San Diego as fine a bay for vessels under 300 tons as was ever formed by nature in her most friendly mood to mariners. Others might have been motivated by the quest for gold in California, the famous gold rush, which we're going to be talking about a little bit later. For women, there might be opportunities to act as prostitutes in some of the mining towns uh, along the way. Others might have simply been displaced farmers from the East. We talked in some of the previous lectures about how the East was getting more and more crowded, land was becoming more and more scarce, and so there might have just been those who were pushed away from the East and forced to find some kind of opportunity in the West. Others might have been fleeing some of the kinds of troubles and difficulties that we've talked about in some of the previous lectures. Some wanted to get away from the what they viewed as the uh, firm hand of government in the East. Some of them were seeking greater freedom. I talked about utopian communities in the previous lectures. Uh, some of them might have wanted to get away from the cities of the East, and we talked about some of the various problems that afflicted cities, whether it was crime or uh, health concerns. Others might have been struggling through uh, one of the various economic depressions that hit the country during this era. Uh, serious economic depressions in 1837 and 1841, and we've already talked a little bit about some of these, but that might have left some people uh, out of work or even homeless and, again, forced to seek opportunities in the West. And finally, there is a factor that we might call missionary zeal, and we're going to be talking about some of these uh, factors related to this later in the lecture. The quest for uh, what might be described as heathen souls to convert out west. And we'll talk more about that in just a moment. So individuals might have migrated to the west for any one of hundreds of different reasons. But we might also think about broader factors, national and societal uh, motivations, that drove the, the country as a collective to begin to move towards the west and fill up uh, the expanse of land out to the west. So we might think broadly about factors like population growth. I mentioned, you know, some individuals seeing their opportunities limited in the east. Well, broadly speaking, the whole country is growing, the population is growing. 
we as a collective need more territory to expand into. There's also a motivation to expand and fill up the lands of the West. We think about the Louisiana Purchase. We need to move into those lands to protect against the other nations who bordered on those territories. And we're going to talk about the Mexican War uh, a little bit later in these lectures. But British territory is still looming up to the north. There's even uh, Russian settlements coming down the, the west coast. And so we have a national motivation to fill up those lands to prevent other countries from moving in. We can also think more broadly just about economic expansion. The country is growing. We need more land for cotton production. We need more agricultural territory. And so in that vein, we might live into Thomas Jefferson's vision of an empire of liberty, this agrarian nation um, making use of the, the rich soil and farmland that, uh, that nature provided uh, in this continent. We can also think just about the sort of natural progression of things, technology, transportation, um, making the journey to the West easier. We talked a little bit about that in previous lectures. We'll talk more later. But as the, the process becomes less arduous, more and more people are going to do it. And finally, we're going to be talking about the expansion of slavery. And many people in the country motivated powerfully to obtain more land and territory that would fall under uh, slavery, which would maintain the balance of power in Congress or even shift the balance of power more in favor of slaveholding states. So all of these different causes drive westward expansion. And yet many in America are dissatisfied with these reasons. If you think about it, many of these motives are selfish, perhaps cruel or even heartless to the inhabitants we encounter in those parts of the West. And so we begin to see in the 1840s the rise of a new ideology used to explain westward expansion. It's the idea known as manifest destiny. This broad continental vision of expansion across the continent, not by war and conquest, but by right and peace. In fact, divine right. This idea was first written by John L. O'Sullivan in 1845 who wrote, It is the right of our manifest destiny to overspread and to possess the whole of the continent which Providence has given to us for the development of the great experiment of liberty and federated self-government entrusted to us. He goes on, This is our high destiny, and in nature's eternal inevitable decree of cause and effect we must accomplish it. Who then can doubt that our country is destined to be the great nation of futurity? So it is divinely ordained, or the right given by God, to fill up this continent. Now I think by the end of our discussion during this chapter, we'll begin to wrestle with a question. Was it really the divine right granted by God? that white settlers fill up the continent? Or was it something else? Were there other, perhaps less pleasant motives that drove Americans to fill up the continent? We'll address those kind of questions when we get to the end of the chapter. In the meantime, let's talk a little bit about the process itself of making this journey uh, across the continent to the West and again, I think it's important to understand just how difficult and dangerous and arduous this was to grapple with the motivations. One had to be powerfully motivated to make this journey across the West. It was not an easy or pleasant experience. Now, many of the settlers of this era made the journey across the Oregon Trail, which in the early years was really the only um, trail connecting East and West. And it remains a prominent um, kind of passageway across the West until the advent of the Transcontinental Railroad just after the Civil War. But the Oregon Trail was approximately 2,000 miles long. It really started to be used by many settlers uh, following the 1843 expedition that was known as the Great Migration, in which more than 100 wagons and Dozens and dozens of families made the journey all together 
along the Oregon Trail across the country. When we think about what this journey entailed, if you were to travel along the Oregon Trail during that period, the 1840s and 50s, the journey was likely to take at least five months and possibly longer. So, of course, the timing of the journey was all important. Uh, you had to be on your way by April or so, or you were destined to get stuck in the Rockies in the middle of the harsh winter. Settlers had obviously had to bring everything that they possessed with them, and so in many cases they sold their homes and their belongings and then gathered just what was necessary to make this journey, uh, including essential supplies and foodstuffs uh, and rifles and ammunition to protect themselves along the way. They typically traveled in small wagons about 6 feet wide and 10 to 12 feet long, pulled along the way by oxen or mules, and you can see some of that in this picture here. At other parts of the journey, they might walk alongside the wagon or perhaps uh, ride horses along the way, but it was a very uh, difficult and brutal trek. There were few landmarks along the way, but one of the important ones was Independence Rock, which is actually a huge slab of granite located in what is today Wyoming. That marked roughly the halfway point along the trail, and if settlers reached it by July 4th, they knew that they were on schedule and were likely to complete the journey before winter set in in the mountains. Not all groups were so lucky. Occasionally, they started their journey too late or encountered delays along the way, which meant they got stuck before they could reach their final destination. The most notorious of these cases was the Donner Party, who traveled on the Oregon Trail in the spring of 1846. Unfortunately, they attempted to take a new route along the Oregon Trail and traveled into terrain that ended up being harsher and more difficult than the established trail itself. They ended up losing some of their cattle and wagons along the way, and by the time they reached the Sierra Nevada Mountains, it was already early November, and an early heavy snowfall trapped them in the mountains, where they were stuck until the following spring. Things got so bad in that harsh winter that some members of the party resorted to cannibalism to survive. Of the 87 original members of the Donner Party, only 48 survived the ordeal uh, and escaped the next spring. Obviously, this is a harsh example, perhaps the harshest, in the history of the Oregon Trail. But many, many people died along the way in this journey, even under good circumstances. They might succumb to disease or weather-related things. They might get injured along the way. Uh, many people fell out of the wagons or got run over by uh, the, the wagons along the way. And, of course, there was the possibility of Indian attack, although that has been uh, way overblown in uh, the stories from American folklore. Uh, we will talk about some instances of this a little bit later in the lectures. There were occasional clashes between the travelers and Indians, but for the most part, uh, Indians left them alone or even tried to benefit from exchange, trading goods with them, or in some cases, uh, negotiating a sort of toll for uh, free passage across their territory. <laughs> 